What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. As promised, here I am to teach you how to decoction mash and why you should consider doing it. Um, it's a great way to make amazing beers like this Czech Amber Lager here. This is not mine, uh, this is from Notch Brewing, but it is still a phenomenal example of that style. Considering it's worth doing for a full-scale commercial brewery like Notch, it's definitely worth doing as a home brewer. So let's jump into it. So first of all, what is decoction mashing? Decoction mashing is really kind of a variation on a step mash. Um, so instead of using direct heat or boiling water infusions to step your main mash up from one temperature to the next to the next and so on and so forth, you're actually taking a portion of that grain and liquid out of the main mash, this is your decoction, and you are raising it up to boiling. You're gonna boil it then for several minutes, usually about 15 to 30 minutes, and then return it back into the main mash to raise the temperature of the main mash up to the next step. This does a few things besides raising the temperature of the main mash, though. It actually creates melanoidins, which are deep, rich, uh, very, very powerful flavor compounds that deeply elevate the maltiness of a beer. And also, you're going to darken the color of the beer. You're also going to literally explode starches in the malt, uh, which is going to make them far more easily accessed by the enzymes in the main mash, and therefore actually raise your efficiency. It started out as a historical brewing technique, way before the advent of temperature control and thermometers. Decoction mashing was just simply the way beer was made. Brewers knew that different temperature steps in the mash created different effects for the final beer, and so they desired to hit each of those temperature steps. But like high fidelity temperature measurement was not really a thing, so they had to understand the relationship between a known volume of liquid at an approximated temperature and a known volume of liquid at a known temperature, which was boiling. The relationship between those two things could dictate how they would move from step to step in the mash, and decoction mashing was the way they would do that, by removing part of that mash, boiling it, and returning it to the main mash. And this effectively got the most out of the under-modified malts that really existed before the second half of the 20th century. And then the next question is, well, hey, it's 2023. Why the hell would I use a decoction mash? It's like a historical method that doesn't need to be used anymore because we have well-modified malts that can make a perfectly fine beer at a single temperature, right? Well, yes and no. There really are a few reasons why someone might want to go through the pain and the effort of actually conducting a decoction mash deliberately. Firstly, is to be authentic. I mean, there's, trust me, there's a lot of purists out there when it comes to lager. There's a lot of snobs out there, and the one way to make them happy is to do everything the hard and old-fashioned way. But really, at the end of the day, being authentic is more than just impressing people who think they're important. The uh, really important thing here is you're connecting with the beer in a certain way that gives you a newfound respect for the way it used to be made for centuries. It's a labor of love and it takes a very long time and a ton of effort and it makes you really feel a lot more invested in the beer you're making as well. It's actually really interesting how that works. At least that's how I uh, tend to interpret it, but it's uh, a little bit different for everybody, I think. Secondly, you're gonna get a higher efficiency than you otherwise would with a standard single infusion uh, or even actually just a regular step mash uh, because you're exploding those starches and getting a a little bit more out of them. So it is very useful to get the most out of your malt, um, and you're gonna do a better job with this, I think, if you actually use under-modified malt. But thirdly, and probably most significantly, is because you're gonna create melanoidins. Melanoidins um, are created by the Maillard reaction, which takes place when you're boiling that mash. The Maillard reaction is responsible for the flavors that make seared meat taste so good, that make grilled vegetables taste so good, that make roasted potatoes taste so good, or even, you know, a slice of toast out of the toaster. That's the Maillard reaction, and that's why it's so delicious. The same thing is true with beer. When you create that Maillard reaction in the decoction, you're creating those dark, deep, delicious, rich, malty flavors that make the beer just go to a totally different level. Um, and that's why I think most people still go through the pain and effort of a decoction mash. Yes, we do have melanoidin malt available to us. And yes, you can boil for a long time to get a similar effect. These can get you very, very close and honestly will get you a perfectly fine melanoidin character. But they're not the same I think, as a decoction mash. Anyway, guys, you probably came here to see how to decoction mash. If you're still watching at this point, you want to know how this whole thing works. So let's go into my Czech Dark Lager Brew Day, and we'll talk about exactly how to do this at the homebrew level. 
So before you even get started, you're going to need a few pieces of equipment if you want to do a successful decoction mash. The first thing you're going to need is a second kettle of some sort or a pot that can hold somewhere around like two to four gallons, depending on the size of the decoction you're going to be taking. With this kettle, ideally the heavier uh, and thicker, the better, because you want even heat distribution on this thing to avoid scorching and hot spots. You're also going to want a second heat source. This can be a gas burner or it can be uh, a stove top if that works for you um, or a bottom heated electric element the only thing I would definitely avoid using is an immersed electric element like the one you see in the claw hammer system uh, you don't want to have an element in direct contact with the grain because that can scorch it in my case I'll be using the side burner on my gas grill which does a decent enough job to get the job done the last thing you're going to need is a scoop of some sort to get the grain out. I really recommend this one quart dipper that I'm using here. I will link that in the description. It's just very handy for measuring and also for getting all the grain in and out of the decoction. So with the decoction, there's actually a very specific formula you can use, um, and I'll put that up on screen now, to determine the volume of your decoction. This formula is based on the temperature you're trying to hit and also the volume of your mash. Um, uh, and kind of just breaks down the relationship between those different things. Now, you don't have to use this formula specifically. Um, there are useful decoction calculators out there on the internet, and if you use Beersmith, Beersmith also has a very robust decoction calculator for you as well. But nine times out of 10, I'm honestly just gonna use the rule of thumb, which is if you just take out one third of your mash volume, with an emphasis on thick mash going into the decoction, then you're gonna be fine and you're gonna generally get pretty close to your temperature targets. If you're using an electric kettle like mine with temperature control, then at the end of the day, the decoction volume is kind of a moot point because if you miss your target temperature, you can just use the electric element to make up for the difference. Uh, but not everyone has that kind of setup, so sometimes there's definitely value in using that formula to try and figure out exactly the right decoction volume. As far as how many decoctions to take, you can do a single, double, or triple decoction to your heart's delight, really. Um, but at the end of the day, it has to fit in somewhere logically within a step mash schedule. Uh, if you're doing a single decoction, the easiest place to do it is between your uh, mash rest and your mash out. The double decoction schedule gets a bit more complicated, and in this particular recipe, I'm doing a double decoction. This would be a decoction pulled at the protein rest and uh, boiled for the entirety of a beta sacrification rest at a lower temperature. Returning it to the mash raises it to an alpha sacrification rest temperature of about 158. Uh, we'll pull a second decoction at that point, boil it, and then return it to the mash for the mash out rest. You can also do a triple decoction mash, which is really only used in Czech Pilsners. Uh, but a triple decoction would involve actually pulling your decoction and doing a extended protein rest. You do a short boil on your decoction prior to uh, raising from the protein rest to the beta rest. Then you do another decoction between beta and alpha rest, and then you do a final decoction between alpha rest and mash out. Double decoction makes the most sense to me, but triple decoction is definitely worth it if you want to do a check pilsner in the most authentic way possible. When you take your decoction out, this is the consistency you're going to want to see. Uh, mostly grain with a little bit of liquid in there. The reason why we have such a high grist to liquor ratio is because we want to ensure that we have both a very fast conversion of uh, starches into sugars in the decoction itself, which gives you the highest possible efficiency before those enzymes are actually denatured by boiling them. And then also because this gives you the best melanoidin creation and it helps to uh, really just darken that decoction and get the most color and melanoidin character into your beer as possible. When you're using this particular method, if you want to flex that ratio, that's fine. A higher amount of liquid in there will reduce the risk of scorching, but it will also reduce the amount of melanoidin creation. So just keep that in mind. Once you've pulled your first decoction and you've started to heat it up, I really would recommend holding a very quick sacrification rest at roughly 140 to 160 Fahrenheit for about 10 minutes or so. Depending on the rate at which you're heating up, this may actually just pass through that range within about 10 minutes, uh, which is more than sufficient to get as much conversion as possible out of it. Because of that extremely thick grist to liquor ratio, you're gonna get a very fast conversion this way. If you're raising your temperature too quickly on the decoction, you will scorch it, so uh, there's definitely some benefit in using a lower wattage element or a uh, lower BTU burn 
burner when you're doing this. When you're boiling your decoction, you can boil it for anywhere between 15 minutes to an hour if you even want to. The longer you boil it, the more melanoidin character you'll get, the more color you'll get, but also you will start to actually get tannins um, because they do exist and they are extracted just at a lower rate than if you were sparging or boiling grain husks in the boil itself. So I really honestly would not recommend boiling your decoction for any longer than about half an hour. Uh, it's plenty of time. You get loads of melanoidin character within a half an hour if you do things correctly. Once that very fast sac rest is complete, you'll go ahead and continue raising the temperature all the way up until you boil it. And here comes the part that everyone kind of hates about decoction mashing and the part that is just honestly the most work. And that is you're just gonna have to constantly stir and stir and stir uh, for the entirety that you're actually keeping this thing on the heat. Uh, you will scorch your decoction and you will burn the grain if you don't stir constantly. Uh, and this can happen as quickly as a few minutes left by itself. So whatever you're doing, just constantly focus on that decoction, scraping off the bottom and stirring it. You want to do your best to always keep things in motion and constantly in circulation. That way you will get the best melanoidin character you possibly can by circulating all the grain around, but also will avoid scorching it, will avoid ruining your beer. Trust me, I have scorched the decoction before, it will kill the beer. As soon as your current mash rest is complete and your timer goes off, immediately take your decoction off the burner and bring it back into your main mash. You'll start adding it in just a little bit at a time, usually one or two quarts at a time, gradually because we want to avoid overshooting our next target mash temperature and that can happen if you have a large decoction. The rule of thumb for me tends to actually uh, undershoot the temperature a little bit, but that's again the benefit of having that electric system helps me to recirculate and get back to my target temperature relatively easily. Um, not everyone has that benefit though, so if you do overshoot your temperature, it can be a problem because you'll denature enzymes in your main mash. So just be sure to do this gradually. You'll also notice that the grain as it's being added back into the main mash is really dark relative to how it started, uh, and that is literally visually observing the melanoidins right there. You can see that that Maillard reaction has taken place and what you're looking at is pure flavor. So when you're adding your decoction back into your main mash, if your main mash hits your target temperature, stop adding it back into the main mash and wait for your decoction to come back down to a uh, similar temperature to the main mash before adding the rest of it back in. And at this point, if you're doing a multiple decoction mash, I would recommend pulling your second decoction as soon as possible. Uh, should be about a similar volume of liquid and then bringing it back to your secondary burner and just repeat the process. Um, with a second and a third decoction, you don't need to worry about holding a sacrification rest because you've already converted pretty much all of the starch that's in the mash in general. And all you're doing at this point is just facilitating the next temperature step. If you do this a couple times, you'll get the hang of it pretty quickly. It's uh, complicated on paper, but once you do it in person, it's actually not all that complicated. So um, it's definitely worth doing a few times just to get the hang of it. And I think you'll really enjoy the, the way that it makes your beer taste. It's quite a lot of fun. But don't be surprised when your decoction raises your efficiency by an absolutely ridiculous margin, especially if you're already using well-modified malts. And normally, my brew house efficiency on either the claw hammer system or this Blickman Brew Easy is around 70 to 75%. When I decoction mashed this Czech Dark Lager, I actually got an efficiency north of 85%. So don't be surprised when your efficiency is much, much higher than you initially anticipated. Um, but just make a little bit of an account for that when you're building your recipe. Maybe use a few pounds less overall base malt uh, and that should help you stay on track. Hopefully that gives you guys a good understanding of the process of decoction mashing. Um, if I didn't answer all of your questions, please let me know in the comments down below and I will get back to you. But stay tuned for the rest of the video because I have a bunch of frequently asked questions about decoction mashing that I'm going to go ahead and answer now. Now, a lot of people, when they learn how to decoction mash for the first time, are going to have a couple questions, um, especially if you already know a little bit about how all grain brig works. The first question I usually get when I talk about decoction is, aren't you afraid of tannin formation? Because you're boiling the grain husks, right? So you're theoretically going to get a ton more tannins, uh, which can make the beer very astringent and undrinkable. Well, that doesn't happen because of one very specific reason, pH. So normally when you're sparging, you do not want to sparge above a certain temperature because you're going to extract tannins from the grain husks. And the same thing is true if you're actually boiling those grain husks. 
you see the sparge pH is actually much higher than the mash pH. Uh, and specifically the pH that's in that very thick decoction. Because of that, the rate at which tannins are extracted is much, much lower than if you were sparging or boiling those grain husks. The second question I often get is, how come you're not denaturing enzymes by boiling? And the answer to that one is, well, partly you are. Um, when you take out that thick mash from the main mash, the enzymes that are already in the main mash are actually in that liquid. So that's why you want to make it a thick decoction. That's one of the reasons why you want to make it a thick decoction. Um, so those enzymes are going to remain in the liquid and they're going to continue to convert starches that are in the main mash. That's why we also do that 10 minute sacrification rest on that first decoction because you want to make sure you're getting at least the uh, conversion out of that uh, 12 or so quarts of decocted thick mash you're getting there. But once you actually pass that boiling point, yes, you are denaturing the enzymes in the decoction. But because there's plenty of enzymes left in the main mash, you're not going to have any trouble converting that same sugar. Next question is, why is the efficiency so much higher sometimes when you're decoction mashing? And it's because you're exploding amylopectin. When you go up to that boiling temperature, you're taking these starches and literally physically destroying them. Um, as a result, you're taking these starches and smashing them up into smaller molecules which are accessible to those enzymes in the main mash. And that is not something that is normally accessible to enzymes in the main mash, even when you're using well-modified malt. And the last question is, is this necessary? Like, do I need to do this for a check clogger? No, you don't. I said it at the beginning of the video and that's worth repeating. This is only something you should do if you want to do it. I do recommend everyone tries it at least once because it's an amazing process that is really something that gets you so much more in touch with the beer you're creating. There's a lot that's valuable about that process that potentially has a placebo effect in making you appreciate the beer more. Um, but it's something that I do recommend everyone tries at least once because it has that special effect. You might like it so much that you actually fall in love with the process and use it on every beer. You might hate it so much that you never touch it again. That doesn't matter to me. I just recommend you try doing it at least once because it is really interesting. But if you want to get a beer that has a final result that is very similar to a decoction mash, then go ahead and add two to 5% melanoid and malt to your grist and then do a step mash as you would have normally done with the decoction and then just do a 90 minute boil on top of that. All three of those things together should get you a very similar character, um, but I'd still hold firm to the belief that I don't think it's quite the same, uh, but it gets you in the ballpark and sometimes that's enough. But at the end of the day, guys, just make your beer the way you wanna make your beer and I think everyone will be happy with that. But consider this a new tool in your arsenal if you've never tried it before. It's quite a lot of fun uh, and it's a labor of love. So. Anyway, guys, I hope you learned something and enjoyed this video. And if you did, please, before you leave, hit that like button and also subscribe if you haven't already. If you enjoyed this video, chances are you're going to enjoy the other videos I also have on my channel. So please check them out when you got some time. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. I've got this and many other designs in the merchandise store, which you can find down in the description box below. Um, there's also a Patreon down there. And my Patreon supporters have made huge, huge improvements for this channel and helping out in so many ways. So you really do have my personal thoughts. Thanks for doing that. Uh, and then also there's channel memberships and the super thanks button if you want to hit either of those things as well. Uh, makes a lot of a difference for me. And then there's an Amazon store I have also down in the description box where you can find all of the homebrewing equipment uh, and also my channel production equipment if you're curious about that. Uh, if it's all available on Amazon, it's on that store. And then last but certainly not least, there's also my socials. So I have Instagram and Facebook where you can find me there. That's at The Apartment Brewer. Uh, and you'll find more frequent content updates than here on YouTube, but you'll get to see what's going to be coming to the channel in the very near future and kind of keep it up to date with day-to-day -day things. And I hope you enjoy those things as well. Anyway, if you're still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. Um, this was quite a lot of fun to produce and make, so I really hope you got something out of it and enjoyed it. And until the next one, cheers. Cheers.